Or the thing's hard to get out. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are again. Thank you for having me. I've got a very special piece for you today. Um, I'm getting ready for this. I don't want to say too much because um, of the structure of this incredible thing. Um, there's been books written about this piece. There's been dissertations, there's been journal articles. There was a stage play called The Goldberg Variations. Um, it's been in the soundtracks for various films. Um, I hope no one's too familiar with the movie Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> because if you have seen it, I hope it doesn't ruin the piece for you. Anyway. Um, <laughs> It's named after Johann Gottlieb Goldberg. He was a young, at the time that this was written, he was a young harpsichordist um, who was probably the first performer of this piece. It was written by Bach, performed first by Goldberg. Um, the actual title that Bach gives this piece is, and I quote, keyboard exercise consisting of an aria with diverse variations for harpsichord with two manuals composed for connoisseurs for the refreshment of their spirits by Johann Sebastian Bach, composer for the Royal Court of Poland and the Electoral Court of Saxony, Kapellmeister and Director of Choral Music in Leipzig, Nuremberg, Balthasar Schmidt, publisher. Wow. Typical German. The Goldberg Variations, for sure. Um, this is a quote uh, from uh, Bach's first biographer. His name was Johann Nicolas Forkel. Um, he says about this piece, for this work, we have to thank the instigation of the former Russian ambassador to the electoral court of Saxony, Count Kaiserling, who often stopped in Leipzig and brought there with him, with him the aforementioned Goldberg in order to have him given musical instruction by Bach. The Count was often ill and had sleepless nights at such times, Goldberg, who lived in his house, had to spend the night in an antechamber so as to play for him during his insomnia. Once, the Count mentioned in Bach's presence that he would like to have some clavier pieces for Goldberg, which should be of such a smooth and somewhat lively character that he might be a little cheered up by them in his sleepless nights. Bach thought himself best able to fulfill this wish by means of variations the writing of which he had until then considered an ungrateful task on account of the repeatedly similar harmonic foundation. But since at this time all his works were already models of art, such also these variations became under his hand. Yet he produced only a single work of this kind. Thereafter the Count always called them his variations. He never tired of them, and for a long, a long time sleepless nights meant Dear Goldberg, do play me one of my variations. <laughs> Bach was perhaps never so rewarded for one, one of his works as for this. The Count presented him with a golden goblet filled with a hundred louis d'or. Nevertheless, even had the gift been a thousand times larger, their artistic value would not yet have been paid for. So, this is a late work. Um, I think. It's an experiment by Bach. As he said, he thought variations would be boring because it's the same, essentially, what he's doing is it's the same chord progression played over and over and over and over again. Um, there's 30 variations in this set. And he starts with, as it says, the aria, the theme. An aria is, um, it's, it's a term from opera. It literally means air. Um, but it's, it's basically as, you know, as the plot would be happening in an opera on stage, one character would kind of come forward and give the soliloquy as what, like what they were feeling at that time. And that was called an air or an aria. Um, so there's an operatic influence in this, but there's also, as with all of Bach, there's a dance influence. Bach is always dancing. His music is always dancing anyway. Um, this particular dance character is a, a Spanish dance called the Saraband, and it's the, the rhythmic character is in three. It's a very slow dance in three. It goes one, two, three, one, two, three. It's a sort of processional one, two, three. There's an emphasis on the two. 
Um, so the theme is both song and dance at the same time. Um, with a lot of late works by any art artist, I think, they start restricting their tools. I think a lot of artists, as they get older, they want to see how much they can do with as little as possible. So he so Bach sets himself a lot of a lot of restrictions. Um, he don't want to get too granular here. Um, a lot of this is based on the number three. Almost everything is based on the number three in this piece. There are 30 variations. Um, for a lot of these pieces, there are three voices, three interlocking melodic voices in each variation. There's two played by the right hand, one by the left. Sometimes they overlap. Um, the aria itself consists of 32 bars. There are 32 sections to this piece because it starts with the aria, 30 variations, and he plays the aria at the end again, just so you remember it. It's this nice bookend. So there's 32 sections of the piece. The piece has, or the, the actual theme has 32 bars. Um, this is actually kind of a personal thing for me too, because I'm 30 years old and I just, I just learned this piece. <laughs> and it took me two years to learn it. This is one of the longest, pieces it, it took me to, to, to learn. It's incredibly intricate. Um, so there's 10 groups of three in this piece as well. In all of our variations, there's 10 groups of three. The variations come in three forms. The first are these kind of character pieces. They can be dances, they can be evocations of orchestral works. So you get a big overture, kind of grand introductory overture. It's called a French overture. Um, there's actually one character piece. It's, it's toward the end. It's variation number 25. It's very slow. Uh, it's often called the Black Pearl variation because it's, it's in the minor key. It's very dark and the Harmonies, he starts getting really creative and weird with this. This almost sounds like it could have been written in the last century. Very interesting variation. So that's the first category of variations in this set, right? Character pieces. Second, we have these virtuoso, fast variations that cross hands. So you'll often start like that, and it'll go like that and back, and like that, right? This is called, this is, by the way, this is something Bach does a lot. That, crossing, intersection. It's an old, ancient Greek poetic form called chiasm. It comes from the Greek word chi, which looks like an X. Um, Bach does this in a lot of his pieces, chiasm. In fact, his own signature, his monogram, is a cross like that. Very genius, I, I could go into that too, but that would take 10 minutes to explain. Um, so, by the way, he got this idea from the French, and crossing. And uh, there's a French piece, a French Baroque piece that was written around the same time as this, um, called uh, Three Hands, Les Trois Mains. And basically it just crosses hands a lot. And so it sounds like there's three hands playing, even though there's only two, because of the crossing hands. So that's part of the three numerology in this that Bach is working with as well. So that's the second category of variations. <laughs> there's character pieces, there's hand crossing, the last are the canons. And everyone's heard of canon in D, correct? Does anyone know what a canon is? Around, thank you, who said that? Yes, could you sing <laughs> for me, with me, could you sing "Row, Row, Row Your Boat" with me? <laughs> row, okay, everyone, everyone, right. row, 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 right? So one, two, row, 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 row your boat, boat gently down, down the stream. Row, 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 row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily,
get the idea, right? So it's the same melody, but it's offset by a bar. The same thing is happening, but it's just offset, right? He does this 10 times, actually nine times in this piece. So you get the character piece, then the hand crossing, then the canon. If anyone wants to keep track of how this piece progresses. <laughs> Um, not only does he do nine canons, the first one, he starts on the same pitch. So the second one comes in right there, so it sounds like... of a second above. Right? Third canon starts the interval of a... Thank you. <laughs> not only in these groups of three, but as a larger, a larger group. So the first, um, the first and the last groups of three, he sw for whatever reason, he switches the hand crossing and the character piece. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is he splits the piece in half, directly in half, because the aria is a 32 bar piece. That's split in half, so 16, 16. He splits this piece in half. At variation 15, which is the first minor variation, just happens to be the first piece in a minor key. Variation 16, after that, is a French overture, which means he, he wants to kind of alert you. <laughs> like this is a structural, a major structural moment. Um, a French overture, by the way, if anyone, anyone's seen or heard um, Handel's Messiah, that starts with a French overture. It's this kind of grand dotted rhythm, and it usually starts with the, with the big dotted rhythm thing, and then he moves into a fugue, which is another kind of, kind of like a canon, but not quite as complex. But yeah, this, this dotted rhythm thing where you go, bum, ba bum ba da bum ba da bum ba da ba ba that's called a dotted rhythm, where you've got, you know, one big beat, and then short beat, and then long beat. So it's, it's meant to sound grand, kind of royal, regal. French overture. So that's variation 16. The last canon. I mentioned there, there should be 10 canons, right? There's 30 variations, there should be 10. Um, the very last variation, instead of being the 10th canon, he calls it a quad libit, which is Latin for as you like it. Um, and here's what Bach's biographer Forkult says about the quad libit. Um, because it was a custom of the Bach family to actually improvise quad libits. All, all of Bach's relatives were musicians. It's a musical family. Would have loved to be them in the room at this time. Here's what he says. As soon as they were assembled, a chorale was, struck, was first struck up. From this devout beginning, they proceeded to jokes, which were frequently in strong contrast. That is, they then sang popular songs, partly of comic and also partly of indecent content all mixed together on the spur of the moment. This kind of improvised harmonizing they called a quad libit, and not only could laugh over it quite wholeheartedly themselves, but also aroused just as hearty and irresistible laughter in all who heard them. So, what he does with this quad libit is, obviously he continues the harmonic structure of the theme, but in addition to that, he puts in two German folk songs. The first one is, I'm going to try to sing it. Ich bin so lang nicht bei dir gewest, rück her, rück her. Which means, I've been so long away from you, come here, come here. And the second one is, Kraut und Rüben, ha, 
haben nicht vertrieben. Cabbage and turnips have driven me away. Had my mother cooked meat, I'd have opted to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Musical jokes. Bach is a clever guy. So we'll hear these two themes. That's the first one. This is the second one, the cabbage and the turnips. Okay. Enough about that. If, if all this is just, just like dizzyingly com complex, yes, it is. So <laughs> toss all that out and just enjoy, you know, this 50 minutes of music. It's, it's just incredible. It, it's, and all this complexity, you, you, is, it's not on the surface. It's just, it's just how he, how his mind conceived of this stuff and how he kind of limited his artistic means to just create a journey, basically. And think of it as a journey. Or if you have a meditation practice in your life, Consider, consider, you know, embarking on that. I mean, it's this is music meant to, as the Count wanted, Count Kaiserling wanted, to soothe and to enliven. And so, if it does that, I will have succeeded. Um, uh, I, I would like to read, just before I play, right? I would like to read. Um, this is the last paragraph of one of my favorite poems, T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. Um, and this is a long poem. It's about 30, 30 page long poem. <laughs> 30. <laughs> um, but the reason I want to quote it is because the aria begins the piece and ends the piece. And it, it comes full circle. And so I think this, this bit of poetry kind of beautifully expresses that. Eliot says, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown remembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning, at the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard, in the stillness, between two waves of the sea, quick now, here, now, always, a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flame are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. Box gold reservations.
Good. Oh, we gotta stop this thing. I hope you enjoy.